Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversations. Today we will have an assessment of Mr. Modi's defense policy. It is close to four and a half years since the Modi government came to power in New Delhi. Given its hyper-nationalist credentials, there was a lot of expectation that Mr. Modi was going to do a lot better in the field of national security and India's defense policy. So probably it would be appropriate for us to ask the question as to how Mr. Modi has performed in the field of national security and defense policy. There has been some momentum in the recent uh, months. Uh, Mr. Modi has set up what is called a defense planning committee and also very recently a strategic policy group, both committees headed by the um, country's national security advisor. But the question is, is it too late in the game for these two committees to make any credible and substantive impact on India's national security and defense policy. Um, to discuss this and more, I have with me in the studio Mr. Praveen Sani. Mr. Praveen Sani is the editor of the Force magazine um, and is the author of three important books, uh, The Defense Makeover, um, Operation Parakram, and uh, just last year he published a book on uh, um, Dragon on Our Doorstep. Um, before joining the Force magazine, or before founding the Force magazine, um, he also worked with the um, the Jane's International Defense Review. Uh, welcome to the National Security Conversation, uh, Mr. Sani. Uh, let me begin uh, with this question that I sort of mentioned earlier on. It's four and a half years, and given his hyper-nationalist credentials, uh, the BJP government was expected to um, do a lot more in the national security and national defense scene. Do you think he has performed adequately? He has lived up to the expectations that people had of Mr. Modi? Uh, my uh, brief answer will be no. In fact, um, under the Modi government, uh, the national security has sharply deteriorated. And I'll give you three reasons, reasons for that. Right. My first reason is that for a government which said that we will be the best in national security as compared to the other governments, they refuse to take ownership of defense. Now, this is important. What is ownership of defense? Ownership of defense basically means that the political leadership, the Prime Minister himself, should have taken stock of the threats to India. Now, why I'm saying this important is because in 2009, it is the Indian Army who propounded the thinking of a two-front war, which was immediately lapped up by the other two services. Correct. Now, on this thinking, is based your capability building. On this capability, capability building is where your modernization money is going. So this is that foundation. If your thinking is awry, if that foundation is not correct, you are actually aimlessly putting money into modernization, building a capability, especially when we do not have a vibrant defense industry. Now you talked about ownership, taking ownership of defense. Now, people could argue that there is a lot of concentration of national security and defense in the prime minister's office these days. Isn't that good enough? No, you see, again, ownership basically means that your defense has to be secure, that our territorial integrity should be secure, right. period. Right. We are one country which has two military lines. One against China, one against Pakistan. So the threats are there. So the point I'm making is, when we are spending about $49 billion every year as our defense budget, it is imperative, it is essential that the government sit down itself and assess the threats and say, all right, can we take on the China threat by war or we have to employ some other means? Can we take on the Pakistan Pakistan threat by war or something else has to be done. This is called taking ownership because we are actually putting money in the modernization. Just to go back to the point that you made. So you're basically saying that there is no big picture understanding of national security and national defense even under this government. Um, it's business as usual. Is that what you're saying? Yes. What I'm saying is that unless you will not very, you won't be clear about the threats you can never be clear about what sort of armed forces you should have. Just to compare the four and a half years of Mr. Narendra Modi with the previous governments, uh, the UPA 1 and UPA 2, how do, you, how do you rate the performance of the India government on national security and national defense issues? So awful. Why? Number one, 
Modi government right from day one said that on national security will be much better than UPA. Right. But they did not come up to the expectation, number one. Number two, they actually put a lot of emphasis on perception management. So, the reality is different. What they are trying to put across is something different. I will give you two very brief examples. One is the 2016 surgical strikes. Correct. They were never surgical strikes. They were political strikes. What does that mean? For a political mission. There was never a military mission. I mean, we can discuss this in detail later. The second point is, this whole campaign of Make in India in defense is nothing more. It's a new label given to what was going on earlier. And why I'm saying this is because two basic game changers for the Make in India campaign, which is for restructuring the industry of India, would have been number one, if you had provided a level playing field to the private sector as much as you give it to the public sector. That has not happened. Right. Number two, how much of money have you put into R&D? We haven't put any money into R&D. So basically, we, were, we are doing exactly what we were doing earlier, which is getting the SKDs, CKDs, you know, those lockdown kits, complete kits, assembling them here and getting some SMEs inside. So whereas we have created some sort of a employment for people through the SMEs, but that bigger mission of creating an industry, it just remains in limbo. So that is why I'm saying that they have not performed compared to the UPA because they drummed up they didn't deliver. Praveen, you, you talked about the new threats. Uh, let me come to that. I often hear from various defense analysts that we are preparing for the last war. We are not really preparing for the future war, the next war. Um, is, there, is that an accurate statement to make? What are the real new threats on the horizon and are we adequately prepared for that? Right. So, uh, my response would be we are not preparing for any war. Forget about the last war or the next war and I will give you four reasons straight for that. Right. Number one. These new threats, what are they? According to, when we see China, according to the 2015 military reforms, one of the things that they have done is, they have brought in jointness. Now, jointness at the policy level, jointness at the war fighting level. And because of the technology that we have, the tactical level has become redundant. What is the implication of that? The implication of that is, Tactical is the level where battles are fought, where the Indian army is involved. Basically, after the reforms and once they fructify in 2020, the role of the Indian army will keep diminishing by the day because there will be no battles. We are looking at the war fighting. Right. See, there are three levels, strategic, operational and there is the tactical. Tactical level is getting eliminated, whereas we are pumping in money, creating a manpower and an army which actually will never fight in war. But you do have it a tactical situation in Kashmir. Again, I'm not talking the peacetime or the proxy war. I am talking of a conventional capability. Number two, I'll tell you, very interesting thing. Under the reforms, they have created what is called the strategic support force. The Chinese. Chinese. Now, this is very important. Tell us something more about yeah. that. This strategic support force is basically what they have done is they have put their space assets their cyber assets, their electronic warfare assets, their psychological warfare of assets, they have put everything together. They have consolidated for a, a double mission. So, this is one step above normal jointness. No, no, it is jointness. What they have done is all these disparate elements were everywhere. Elements of space, elements of cyber, elements of electronic warfare, and elements of psychological warfare, what we call psyops. So, what they have now done is they have consolidated. So, the task of this strategic support force will be support the jointness of the theater theaters as well as do independent tasking. Now, what is independent tasking? Independent tasking is cyber espionage, cyber attacks, space intimidation. Now, they are moving into a deniability role in war. For example, cyber, they do cyber offences, that is deniable. But the message will go to the country which is suffering, that look, they mean war. That is called deniability. So, it will be a mix of no contact and deniability, deniability, but we don't seem to be understanding this. Now, the third threat is the interoperability threat. 
Intraoperability basically means the ability of two countries' armed forces to fight together for a common mission. Now, what this means is that Pakistan has a amount of assets. Because it is in intraoperability with the Chinese, it will get additional assets on friendly price prices from China. It will get all the spare parts so it can fight a longer war than we can because we have to get from spare parts from all over. We don't manufacture anything. They will get all the weapons from there. And more than that, what is not being understood is since 2011, the Chinese military and the Pakistani military have been fighting together in the northern areas. This Giltkil, Baltistan and POK. This basically means that this is really the area where there is a possibility of some sort of a conventional war and there you will find their combined strength. Another thing, the Chinese today are competing with the Americans. You know, there is so much of literature and nobody seems to be paying attention to that. Artificial intelligence in warfare. Now, basically look at three areas. Look at robotics. Look at autonomy of weapon systems, complete autonomy or semi-autonomy of weapon systems and look at machine-human interface. Now, these are the areas where they are going in. Let me simplify that and give you a tangible example. Recently, after we got the S-400, the news came that 48 CH-4s, you know, which is the armed uh, drones, will be given to the Pakistanis by the Chinese. So let me let me let me stop you there. Let me ask you. You've talked about joinness. You talked about interoperability. You talked about artificial intelligence and deniability and no conduct wars. How is India faring on all these counts? In in sort of thinking in in futuristic terms about future threats. How is India faring? Right. So we are denying the interoperability. If we weren't denying the interoperability, we would we would be thinking of revising our two front war thinking. We are not doing that. You see, now this cyber space, what I said, the strategic support force, we are at those preliminary embryonic stages of thinking or doing something. You know, all this talk about creating a new agency for cyber, creating a new, these are all very, these are baby steps. Chinese are way, way ahead. You know, I'll tell you, this is, here is my bottom line on this subject. You know, I keep hearing from people, from analysts, from military people, that there will be no war with China. Of course, there will be no war with China because given the huge disparity between the capabilities of China and India, the future of war is warfare is not war. It is military coercion. Wait a minute, Praveen. So, um, you are saying that we are nowhere near to the Chinese as far as, the, um, as, far as accommodating the modern threats and modern problems are concerned. But Remember, our, we are only spending about under $50 billion. They have three times uh, more than our defense expenditure. So, um, is, it, is it a problem of uh, the uh, budgetary constraints or is it about thinking along those lines? What is missing? So, let's take the example of Russia. See Russia's defense budget and see under Putin how from year 2000 when he became the president to today, in 18 years, he has changed everything around in defense. So basically what you need so is... So it's not the budgetary... Uh, no, mission. it is... Budgetary is one aspect, you know, all this nonsense that goes on, less money. Oh, at least first get your thinking correct. First get that correct. What do you want? First get it correct. What is your threat? First get it correct. How will you tackle threat? Will you tack it, tackle it by diplomatic means? Will you actually use military force? If you will mil use military force, where will you use military force? I mean, these are those big questions which cannot happen without the involvement of the political leadership. So one, one takeaway from what you just said, Praveen, is that you did say that interoperability between the Chinese and the Pakistanis is going to be one reality in the days to come. It's probably it's already, already there. a reality. It's already there. I have been, a, I have been personally a critic of the, um, the, the recent uh, security agreements that India signed with the United States. So in that context, you, would, would you then say that it's probably not a bad idea that India and the United States has a certain amount of interoperability in the Indian Ocean region? or So you see, your question can be answered in two parts. Number one, this theory is not a correct theory that because we cannot do much on the land in the Himalayas against China, because on the border 
legally, militarily, politically, we are weaker than China. So, let us try and do something in the Indian Ocean. This theory is wrong. And why it is wrong is, Doklam proved it. When Doklam happened, nobody came to our rescue. We had to do everything ourselves. So, nobody will come. Now, what is happening in the Indian Ocean region? Indian Ocean region is basically their agenda. About three and a half years back, I had a one-on-one -on -one for full one hour with Admiral Harry Harris. You know, the PAC commander, he was very nice to give me an hour. We sat down, we discussed. And my takeaway from meeting him was one single sentence. And what was that? That we want India to be the pivot for maritime and naval operations in the Indian Ocean region. Now, what does it mean? It basically means, please, that we have limited assets. We do not have a shipbuilding which anyway match ups to the Chinese shipbuilding. So, in the maritime domain awareness, which is intelligence collection, reconnaissance, you know, these agreements that we signed recently, two plus Composa two. With, and all yeah. That, yeah. So, they'll give us the big picture and then they expect us to fight for the protection of the sea lanes of communications. Which the, is also in our interest. Yeah, of course, it is in our interest, but it is in the collective interest. It is not about us because the American oil goes from there, the Japanese oil goes from there. Why the hell should we only be doing that? We should be worrying more about our Achilles heel. You also mentioned earlier on about the, the absence of joinness in the Indian Armed Forces. Uh, in fact, um, the Chinese certainly have much more. The Pakistanis probably have a lot more joiners than the Indians have. We do have uh, the IDS headquarters, the Integrated Defense Staff headquarters. But on the, on the joinness front, how is India faring? So, see, jointness is an operational term. Integrated Defense Headquarters is an administrative headquarters. Nothing to do with it. So, we are talking of operations. Now, when we are talking of operations, how can there be genuine jointness when the two, three forces have not even come to a consensus on the common threat? Mm -hmm. All three services have their own threat perception. Right. right. All the three have not come on a common doctrine. Right. Air Chief General Bipin Rawat says... They have a joint training doctrine now. No, no, joint doctrine. I mean, the very fundamental thing, he is on record saying, Bipin Rawat, that the army will be the lead in operations. That's correct. Whereas any sensible person will tell you, the Air Force has to be in the lead. So, you see, all this talk of intraoperability, they will give you all stray examples. You know, small, small things, we are doing this. The truth of the matter is, it's a military operation. Get your common threats, get your common doctrine, then please talk of jointness. You did mention about the non-contact warfare. What is the concept of non-contact warfare? Is how, how is China gearing up for it? And is India prepared for it? So, non-contact basically is, uh, you know, after the, the Gulf War. The 1991 Gulf War, we had this revolution of military affairs. Right. One country that paid special attention to that was China. From 1990 onwards, they put in a lot of effort, a lot of money in R&D. And today they have a humongous amount of precision standoff weapons. They have a humongous capability in the new domains, three new domains of war. Today there are six domains of war. Land, air, sea, space, cyber, electronic warfare. They have humongous capabilities. So, when you have these sort of capabilities, why exactly will they come into a battle with you and get their soldiers killed? Non-contact war is that a war where the soldiers do not fight and spill blood. There is no meat grinding. They have the capability. We simply don't have it. We still believe. That you see, Doklam again, I have to come back to an example where the army chief and other generals are saying we could have taken them on in Doklam because we are in a superior position. Of course, you are tactically. But the point of the matter is, are they fools to get their soldiers into the, that funnel, Chumbi Valley, and get them killed by you? No. They have so many other means, non contact war means. 
to intimidate you to do military coercion let me understand that you are saying that according to the indian government and many analysts in india the argument was that we ensure that the chinese do not do continue to do what they were doing in um, in 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 doklam um so it was it was basically um um a no win situation for either side that is the uh, that is the narrative that we have in india do you have a different narrative why you yeah. think india lost so out on so i on do doklam? not believe on this narrative at all and here is the reason for that the indian narrative is that north eastern state is are important for us we cannot have them coming in this funnel down in the chumbi valley especially on this uh, jimbari range where from there they can see and direct fire you see now this is the tactics of the 60s 70s and 80s nobody is doing this today i mean why they did what they did is a different reason altogether what is the subtext yeah no so what i am saying is that they never had a intention you see to my mind given their technology and the military capabilities to actually fight a war with you in chumbi valley because that is what they call a battle we saw doklam as a battle they saw it as a war now war is a collection of battles which is why they won and we lost why they won because it is our prime minister who traveled to wuhan to seek peace Xi Jinping didn't come here. He didn't seek an appointment. Not only our prime minister went to Wuhan to seek peace. If you notice in the in the joint statement at Wuhan, it was said strategic military restraint. That was the key thing. Right. And then he immediately travelled to Sochi to meet up with President Putin, knowing fully well he is one guy. Perhaps she will listen to. So you see, when you mistake a battle for war, that means there is something fundamentally wrong. in the political thinking and 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 the, and the military thing so you're saying that after doklam um the indian side requested for an appointment with uh, president xi jinping and then thereafter went and met mr putin what was the reason what where was the pressure coming from uh, yeah. there was no obvious pressure clearly so there's something else you have in mind tell us so the pressure was the military pressure because immediately after doklam in that winter 2016 2017 they did a massive build up right you know air build up land we all know it just come back now they have come back there everything so. is come back yeah. so what was the pressure the pressure was military coercion because the political leadership does not understand the use of military power in foreign policy the worry was about a crisis escalating hmm. they simply do not understand the escalation ladder which is not the case with china because xi jinping heads the cmc the central military commission you see so the pressure was military coercion so this is what i keep saying you see i have heard our diplomat say that this border has been peaceful for so many years no, china border has been fire of course it has been peaceful why because all transgressions are one sided it has been peaceful i mean why would so china, china has been transgressing absolutely. and we've been sort of standing down we have we have not even gone to our patrolling limits this is the truth of the ground now you tell me why will they fire a shot what is the aim of war the aim of war is that when your negotiations break down you go to war to get the defeated party onto the negotiation table to get what you want that is the aim of war that is why you go to war now what was the need for the chinese to fire a shot you tell me when they have been transgressing at will when politically militarily diplomatically they are strong on the border legally they are strong on the border i mean all the wrong treaties that we have signed i mean i have given in details in this book dragon on our doorstep so you're basically making two points one earlier on you said well now you are saying that the chinese have been doing it have been at it for a very long time there has been precious little that has been done by the indian side on the other hand you're also saying that more battalions or more brigades or more men on the ground may not necessarily help so where is the solution what is the solution so the point is that why we are putting more first of all more men on the ground because the last agreement where we did you know in 2013 when we did the agreement which was that if a patrol is able to come in of either side it will not be followed basically what it means is that if the chinese are able to get anywhere in that 
two thousand square kilometers, which they say is our is a, is our disputed border with India. If they come inside, even let's say two kilometers, we cannot throw them out. So we have to stop them, which is why we need more manpower. They've not they've got. So nothing. you're saying that we need to have more manpower on the ground for the banner drill. to stop them i mean they are doing policing duties what else can be done apart from having more men on the ground so therefore what can be done is and this is my basic argument understand military power understand threats based on your threat with the allocations that you have with the money that you can put please build up your defense industry please put money in your r and d don't bluff please bring genuine reforms which must start at the political level with identifying what the threats are again i am repeating and how to tackle them please do all these exercises don't do half way shoddy things they will never work with a power like china so tactical measures will not help you need to have strategic you measures you got it all right let's come to the question of cpc you mentioned cpc earlier on it has been in news a great deal pakistan has been uh, a bit about it um and cpec has been focused on say for example for geo economic reasons are there any geo strategic rationale behind is there any geo strategic rationale behind cpec at all and what are the implications of that for india right so there is both a geo political uh, reason and there is also a military reason you know first of all whenever the the belt and road initiative moves anywhere I mean, this CPEC is a flagship of the Belt and Road Initiative. Right. All right. Now, basically, where they go is that means their asset interests, their people have to be protected. The Chinese, because Chinese are putting their assets, their workers are there. It has to be protected. Especially that means in Pakistan. The, anywhere, anywhere. Okay. It is not Pakistan. So they will have their troops in various parts of exactly. the world. Exactly. So one of the reasons for 2015 military reform was was that the role of the PLA had expanded to protecting the assets of the BRI. You see now, specific to Pakistan, the other problem which nobody seems to be realizing is there are, if not thousands, there are hundreds of Chinese workers there in Pakistan today working on this CPEC. how can we go to war when this cpac first of all will be made after that it will be maintained then the commercial angle will come in you see so the chinese will always be there now in pakistan now think of a war and the air force saying that all right we will go and do a you know a deep strike now imagine you kill 100 or 150 chinese in the strike you are actually inviting trouble on the other front it's simple so basically the presence the military aspect is the presence of the chinese in large number in pakistan has actually made the role for nuclear weapons of pakistan outdated they have no role because there is no way that we can do a war there is only a small corridor where the war can be fought and that very small corridor as i said is the northern border is the northern border facing which is pok and gilgit baltistan and that is exactly where since 2011 they have been doing joint training so you saying that we have very little military option we have in pakistan let's take the example of the 2016 surgical strikes um You, you you mentioned one in one of your uh, answers that it was not a military strike it was a political strike but say the way it ha- it has been played out we, we we are now celebrating the surgical strikes day etc has the surgical strike of 2016 improved india security situation which have pakistan okay so it has worsened it further on two counts number one because the way we did these strikes we immediately informed pakistan which was supposed to be covert operations we told them we are not doing anything further what the message that the pakis got was that these guys do not have the political will for escalation one of the key determinants there are four key determinants for any country's military power what are those four the four are the technology of a country 
the economic power of a country, the military power of the country and the political will. What is this political will? Political will is that the political leadership understands the escalation ladder. So the Modi government actually conveyed to them that we are incapable of escalating, number one. Number two. But the escalation would have happened only if the Pakistanis acknowledged and retaliated after the strike. There was no need to acknowledge because we never did any military operation. Why? Because first of all, surgical strikes are done by the Air Force. The raid is done by the Army. This was not a raid because raid is against legitimate target, which is the Pakistan Army and not the terrorist. And the third thing the Army can do or the Army can do, the second thing is hot pursuit. Hot pursuit basically means somebody is coming and you follow him. Nobody came and we never followed. So, as Jay Shankar pointed out, he was the foreign secretary. Shallow these were These were targeted counter-terror operations. Now, if you start calling counter-terror operations as surgical strikes and you actually announce the next morning, you see General Ranbir Singh, he announced the next morning that Pakistan has been informed and they, this mission is over. I understood that part. Those guys will actually be thinking that you are incapable of doing, I mean, tactically we failed, politically we failed. So this was a bluff and it will stop at that. They would not do anything So we bluffed that. and okay. they are enjoying, now they will reap the harvest. And they are reaping the harvest because if you see the graph of the you know, the infiltration, everything has gone up. Exactly. The violence has increased. My last question to you, um, and that is about, you, you You talked about the need for defense modernization in the country in order to uh, sort of offset the Chinese challenge, etc. But it seems the severe budgetary constraints that we have um, are, are probably going to um, Create in create such impediments, huge impediments in terms of defense modernization. Let's take the example of the defense budget. The overall ratio of revenue to capital expenditure is 65 to 35 percent. Where are we going to do defense modernization with this kind of money, even though you are spending 49 billion dollars? Right. So the answer is very simple. What General Bipin Rawat is trying to do in the army is not reforms; it's internal management. What we need is reforms based on the actual threats and what we need. Now, if you will do that, you will realize that we have to drastically cut down the army. As I pointed out to you, the battles are over with China. You have to put your effort in the operational level of war, war fighting, which is you have to get these standoff capabilities. You have to put money there. The war has changed. This is what I am trying to put across. You see, so budgets are always finite. I gave you the example of Russia. Budgets will always be finite. It's what you do with that. The point is, are you using it judiciously? The answer is no. Praveen, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.